We're entering our second unit in this class, and what I normally like to do with students is, because we're talking about critical thinking, uh, rational argumentation, I like to go through various works of philosophy, read them with you, and talk about them with you. This isn't the most exciting thing that we could be doing in the world, but it should help you develop various skills. Careful reading skills, critical thinking skills, analytical skills. And so what our plan is in this class in the next few units is to read some of these works of philosophy in which we see rhetoric, we see rational argumentation. We're going to go through it and we're going to talk about it. And then we also have some discussion days built in there. Uh, we could take advantage of those if you want, or we could just continue reading and discussing. It doesn't matter to me. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We're going to start with a relatively simple work in the history of philosophy, Bertrand Russell's The Problems of Philosophy. And it's in this book that he provides a very gentle introduction as to what philosophy is, some of the questions that it explores, and some of the answers that it tries to provide to these questions. It shouldn't be too tough for us to get through. The works are going to become increasingly difficult as we go through the semester, culminating, I think, in a very short essay by a uh, mystical thinker who has a lot of weird things going on. But I think this is going to be a good exercise for us in order to develop those skills and take a look at real-world examples of the stuff that we've been talking about in the first unit. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to sit because my back is hurting me <laughs> and I've been standing all morning. But please uh, open up the text, Russell's Problems of Philosophy, to chapter 1. We're just going to read and talk about this. We're going to see what you all think. See what we can mine from some of these sentences. Okay, see if we can understand what Russell is saying. So I'll begin reading, and then maybe I'll pass it off. I'm going to take a few pauses and breaks here so that we can discuss and try to figure out what it is that Russell is getting at. But overall, this shouldn't be a very difficult work. The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. Open up to Chapter 1. The title should be Appearance and Reality. As we'll see, this is the fundamental, one of the most fundamental distinctions philosophers make between, well, how things appear to us and what things are actually like in the world. So please follow along as I read this. Is there any knowledge in the world which is so certain that no reasonable man could doubt it? Let's just stop there. What do you think? Is there any knowledge you have that is beyond any doubt? Okay, what is it, Nevelyn? Uh, that I can think and exist. Okay, good answer. Anything else? Need water. Say that again? Humans need, water. Humans need water. Okay, let me ask you this. What is water? H2O. Do you know that we're not living in a simulation right now? And water is just a stream of electrons. We would still need it. Maybe in the simulation, maybe not in reality. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Okay, not bad. Yeah, anything else? What Russell is bringing up here is a very important idea in philosophy, which is we claim to have knowledge about all these things, about a lot of different things. But depending on what we think the conditions of knowledge are, well, that's going to determine if we really can know anything. Does knowledge require complete certainty? 
or does it not? In order to know something, do you need to know that you know it? Or not? Let those questions float around as we continue. This question, which at first sight might not seem difficult, is really one of the most difficult that can be asked. When we have realized the obstacles in the way of a straightforward and confident answer, we shall be well launched on the study of philosophy. For philosophy is merely the attempt to answer such ultimate questions. Not carelessly and dogmatically, as we do in ordinary life and even in the sciences, as we do in ordinary life, or, uh, but critically, after exploring all that makes such questions puzzling, and after realizing all the vagueness and confusion that underlie our ordinary ideas. So, what is philosophy? What is he saying there? What is it that we're trying to do when we're doing philosophy? Yeah? Come to some conclusion? Yeah, figure out what's going on. Philosophy comes from two ancient Greek words smushed together. Philo and Sophia. Does anybody know what these words mean? What is Philadelphia? What is another name for it? The city of love. Yeah, the city of love or the city of brotherly love, right? Coming from the Greek, philo, meaning love, and Sophia meaning what? Anybody know what that name means? Normally it's a name given to a girl. Sophia, Sophie. It means wisdom. Wisdom or knowledge. So what is philosophy? It's the love of wisdom, or the love of knowledge. When we're doing philosophy, what we're trying to do is basically come to know and understand this stuff. What is the nature of our reality? What is right and wrong? What is true and false? These are all within the domain of philosophy. And so you could rightly say that if you imagine a tree with a bunch of different branches and we have all these fields of inquiry and fields of knowledge, sociology, anthropology, the natural sciences, the arts, the humanities, all that stuff, if you imagine those as branches of a tree, philosophy is the trunk. Philosophy is the search for truth. That's what we're trying to obtain. And so philosophy, he says, is merely the attempt to answer such ultimate questions. What can we know and how do we know it? What is all this stuff? What makes it up? Etc. Etc. In daily life, we assume as certain many things which, on a closer scrutiny, are found to be so full of apparent contradictions that only a great amount of thought enables us to know what it is that we really may believe. In the search for certainty, it is natural to begin with our present experiences. And in some sense, no doubt, knowledge is to be derived from them. But any statement as to what it is that our immediate experiences make us know is very likely to be wrong. It seems to me that I am now sitting in a chair at a table of a certain shape, on which I see sheets of paper with writing or print. By turning my head, I see out of the window buildings and clouds and the sun. I believe that the sun is about 93 million miles from the earth, that it is a hot globe many times bigger than the earth, that owing to the earth's rotation, it rises every morning and will continue to do so for an indefinite time in the future. I believe that if any other normal person comes into my room, he will see the same chairs and tables and books and papers that I see. And that the table which I see is the same as the table which I feel pressing against my arm. All this seems to be so evident as to be hardly worth stating, except in answer to a man who doubts whether I know anything. Yet all this may be reasonably doubted, and all of it requires much careful discussion before we can be sure that we have stated it in a form that is wholly true. 
So what is he saying there? Can somebody paraphrase? What's he trying to get at? This is not a fruitless exercise. This is going to help you understand the text later. It's going to improve your skills. So like physical objects in the world, although we think we all see them the same, uh, he has doubts about whether they actually exist. Right. That's one thing that he's saying. Like, look, you're all sitting at a table right now, right? That's what your eyes are telling you. That's what your sense of touch is telling you. Can you be certain that you're actually sitting at a table? How do you know you're not asleep in your bed right now, dreaming that you're in class? Are there any proofs or tests that you could use to demonstrate you are for sure here in this room and this is real? Pinch yourself? Haven't you experienced pain in a dream? I have. I've died in my dreams. In nightmares. How do you know this isn't a collective hallucination right now? When we were all we're all taking an ayahuasca trip in the Amazon. That's what's really going on. How can we know, right? We claim to have all this knowledge about stuff. We trust what our senses are telling us. But do we have a good reason to trust what our eyes are telling us? Haven't your eyes deceived you in the past? Yeah. yeah. Right? And what else does he say? He's talking about the earth and the sun. Owing to the earth's rotation, it rises every morning and will continue to do, for, do so for an indefinite amount of time in the future. Can we know that for certain? Just because the sun has risen every day in human history so far, does that mean it's necessarily going to rise tomorrow? No, we can't know that, it seems, right? Maybe we can. We have some sort of trust or faith in the uniformity of nature. It's something that's baked into our understanding of these things. And what else? If any other normal person comes into my room, I believe he will see the same chairs and tables and books and papers. Can we be certain of that? Tell me, what color is the table in front of you? Spottled beigey? How do I know... And how do you know that what I'm seeing in my mind when I look at the table is the same color that you're seeing? Our perceptions certainly aren't the same because you're in a different place in the room, right? If you're looking down at the table, it looks like a rectangle. That's, you know, yay big. But from where I'm sitting, if I kneel down a little bit, it's a very thin rectangle. Right? So we each have unique perceptions. How can we be sure that our perceptions are similar? That's another question. To make our difficulties plain, let us concentrate uh, attention on the table. To the eye, it is oblong, brown, and shiny. To the touch, it is smooth and cool and hard. When I tap it, it gives out a wooden sound. Anyone else who sees and feels and hears the table will agree with this description so that it might seem as if no difficulty would arise. But as soon as we try to be more precise, our troubles begin. Although I believe that the table is really of the same color all, the, all over, the parts that reflect the light look much brighter than the other parts. And some parts look white because of the reflected light. I know that if I move, the parts that reflect the light will be different, so that the apparent distribution of colors on the table will change. It follows that if several people are looking at the table at the same moment, no, no two of them will see exactly the same distribution of colors because no two can see it from the exactly same point of view. And any change in the point of view makes some change in the way the light is reflected. So everybody look at the table in front of you. We called it beige or beigey or whatever it is. 
But it would seem like based on where we're all sitting, based on which table we're looking at, how the light is reflecting, the color that we perceive is going to be different. Right? For example, from where I'm sitting, the light is reflecting off the side of the table and it looks white on this side. But if you look at the side of the table, you're going to see maroon. Right? So what does that imply? Our perceptions are relative to our frame of reference, our position in space-time. You can think about this another way, through motion, right? If you're moving at the speed of light, everything is going to appear to be standing still to you. Similarly, if you're driving really fast down the road and somebody's walking very slowly on the sidewalk, when you pass them, they will appear to be still if you're going fast enough. But they're not still, are they? And if you and I were walking at the same speed in this room, and all we were focusing on is each other's eyes and we couldn't see anything else, we would have both appear to each other to be standing still. But that wouldn't be the case, right? For most practical purposes, these differences are unimportant. But to the painter, or the philosopher perhaps, they are all important. The painter has to unlearn the habit of thinking that things seem to have the color which common sense says they really have, and to learn the habit of seeing things as they actually appear. Here we already, uh, here we have already the beginning of one of the distinctions that cause most trouble in philosophy, the distinction between appearance and reality, between what things seem to be and what they are. The painter wants to know what things seem to be. The practical man and the philosopher want to know what they are. But the philosopher's wish to know this is stronger than the practical man's and is more troubled by knowledge as to the difficulties of answering the question. So here we have the first distinction that philosophers often make. It's going to pop up again and again and again in the next few units. The distinction between what appears to us and what things are actually like. Or to use fancy jargon, between phenomena and noumena between what appears and what things are like in themselves. Some thinkers have even gone so far as to say that all we have access to are the appearances of things. We can't actually know what things are like in themselves as they objectively are. Chew on that a little bit. Let that rattle around in your mind. To return to the table, it is evident from what we have found that there is no color which preeminently appears to be the color of the table, or even of any one particular part of the table. It appears to be of different colors from different points of view, and there is no reason for regarding some of these as more really its color than others. And we know that even from a given point of view, the color will seem different by artificial light, or to a colorblind man or to a man wearing blue spectacles, while in the dark there will be no color at all, though to touch and hearing the table will be unchanged. This color is not something which is inherent in the table, but something dependent upon the table and the spectator and the way the light falls on the table. Does anybody know the physics of color? Why do you see the color that you do when you look at the table? Right. Yeah, it's similar to that, yes. The color that you see when you look at the table is a particular wavelength of light that is reflected from the table and is hitting your retina. All the other wavelengths, all the other colors, are either being scattered or absorbed by the table. So, we would like to say objectively that, look, this color is, this table's beige. But really what you're seeing is light reflecting off the table and hitting your eyes. So if it has a real color at all, we would say it is all the wavelengths that is not beige. 
right? Because those are the wavelengths that it is absorbing. What we're seeing is just light reflected. So, in ordinary speech, it appears, it appears that we're wrong when we talk about the colors of things. This beige is not really in the table. It's just the light that's reflected off the table into your eyes. Its real color, perhaps, is all the other wavelengths that we don't see. There's a question to ponder. When, in ordinary life, we speak of the color of the table, we only mean the sort of color which it will seem to have to a normal spectator from an ordinary point of view under usual conditions of light. But the other colors which appear under other conditions have just as good a right to be considered real, and therefore, to avoid favoritism, we are compelled to deny that, in itself, the table has any one particular color. The same thing applies to texture. With the naked eye, one can see the grain, but otherwise the table looks smooth and even. If we looked at it through a microscope, we should see roughness and hills and valleys and all sorts of differences that are imperceptible to the naked eye. Which of these is the real table? We are naturally tempted to say that what we see through the microscope is more real, but that in turn would be changed by a still more powerful microscope. If then we cannot trust what we see with the naked eye, why should we trust what we see through a microscope? Thus again, the confidence in our senses with which we began deserts us. So, feel the table in front of you. You would say it's smooth, right? Is it perfectly smooth? No. No. So what's going on? What is the table really like? Is it smooth or not? Well, maybe it depends on if you're using a microscope. Maybe it depends on if you're looking at it a different way, right? It's the same thing for everything. If you look at one of these lights under a microscope, you're not going to see perfect flatness and uniformity, right? You'll see hills and valleys because of the arrangement of atoms in it. It's not perfectly straight. Same thing applies to color. He's going to say the same thing applies to shape, too. The shape of the table is no better. We are all in the habit of judging as to the real shapes of things. And we do this so unreflectingly that we come to think we actually see the real shapes. But in fact, as we all have to learn if we try to draw, a given thing looks different in shape from every point of view. If our table is really rectangular, it will look, from almost all points of view, as if it had two acute angles and two obtuse angles. If opposite sides are parallel, they will look as if they converge to a point away from the spectator. If they are of equal length, they will look as if the nearer side were longer. All these things are not commonly noticed in looking at a table, because experience has taught us to construct the real shape from the apparent shape. And the real shape is what interests us as the practical man. But the real shape is not what we see. It is something inferred from what we see. And what we see is a constantly changing in shape as we move about the room. So here again, the senses, that is, what we see, smell, touch, feel, and hear, and taste, the senses seem not to give us the truth about the table itself, but only about the appearance of the table. So, why do we call this table smooth? Why do we say that the table is really rectangular? What do we do on the basis of our experiences? Our sensations. He uses an I word. What's the I word? Anybody got it? Yeah. Infer. Infer. What is an inference? Like, like using evidence and observations to make like a claim. Um, right. We can. We distinguished already between what we would call 
deductive and inductive, right? When we had a deductive argument, we knew if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Inferences are not like that. Inferences are based on the evidence, here's what I think it implies. Not that it's necessarily true. So when we're looking out at the world, when we're tasting and touching and, and hearing things and smelling things, we're inferring on the basis of those experiences what the world is actually like. We can't avoid doing this. Everybody does this. But it's important to note, just because we infer the world is, is a certain way doesn't necessarily mean it is that way. Right? That's what it means for something to be an inference. Similar difficulties arise when we consider the sense of touch. It is true that the table always gives us a sensation of hardness, and we feel that it resists pressure, right? Touch the table in front of you. You can't move through it. It pushes back. But the sensation we obtain depends on how hard we press the table and also upon what part of the body we press with. Thus, the various sensations due to various pressures or various parts of the body cannot be supposed to reveal directly any definite property of the table, but at most to be signs of some property which perhaps causes all the sensations, but is not actually apparent in any of them. And the same applies still more obviously to the sounds which can be elicited by wrapping the table. So, we have all these experiences. Depending on how we interface with the world, that's going to give us different experiences and different ideas. What Russell is trying to get us to think about is whether or not we can get to knowledge of reality through our subjective experiences. The average person will say that we can. But once you dig deep into this, you'll see that there are problems with assuming that. Thus, it becomes evident that the real table, if there is one, is not the same as what we immediately experience by sight or touch or hearing. The real table, if there is one, is not immediately known to us at all, but must be an inference from what is immediately known. Hence, two very difficult questions at once arise. Namely, is there a real table at all? And two, if so, what sort of object can it be? It will help us in considering these questions to have a few simple terms of which the meaning is definite and clear. Let us give the name of sense data to the things that are immediately known in sensation. Such things as colors, sounds, smells, hardnesses, roughnesses, and so on. So, sense data. What is that? Stuff that you get from the senses, your sense organs. The hardness of the table is a sense datum. The temperature of the air that you're feeling is a sense datum. The sound that you're hearing when I'm speaking is a sense datum. We shall give the name sensation to the experience of being immediately aware of these things. Thus, whenever we see a color, we have a sensation of the color, but the color itself is a sense datum, not a sensation. The color is that of which we are immediately aware, and the awareness itself is the sensation. It is plain that if we are to know anything about the table, it must be by means of the sense data brown color, oblong shape, smoothness, etc., which we associate with the table. But for the reasons which have been given, we cannot say that the table is the sense data, or even that the sense data are directly properties of the table. Thus, a problem arises as to the relation of the sense data to the real table, supposing there is such a thing. So what kind of picture is he giving us? It's something like this. We receive information about the outside world through our senses. We like to think 
that that sense data really represents what's out there. But there's a question there. Does it actually represent what's really out there? We've already seen in the case of texture and color that what we see and, and with the naked eye and what we feel is not what the table is like when we look at it under a microscope. So are we justified in trusting our senses? And then furthermore, if the sense data that we receive depends on our frame of reference, our instruments, and all of that, is there such a thing as the table? What the real shape or color or texture is like? The real table, if it exists, we will call a physical object. Thus, we have to consider the relation of sense data to physical objects. The collection of all physical objects we call matter. Thus, our two questions may be restated as follows. Is there any such thing as matter? If so, what is its nature? Okay, so what do you all think? What makes up this table? Atoms. Atoms, Atoms and molecules, right? Cool. What makes up this bookmark? Atoms, right? What makes up a dog? Atoms, right? We say that all this stuff, all these objects are made up of what we would call matter. And the form that matter takes are subatomic particles and, and atomic particles and various excitations of these fields. That's what we say makes up this stuff, right? Let me ask you this. Have you ever tasted matter? We taste things made up of matter. Have you ever seen matter? Tell me, what does matter look like? Is it a kind of relative to the object? That's what it seems like. Right? But this thing we call matter, have you ever touched it? You've touched a table, right? you've touched a chair, you've touched a dog. What is this thing called matter? It would seem to be a mental abstraction. It would seem to be something that we think makes everything up, but we can't directly perceive it. Yeah? Now, if you're with me so far, you might start to question, can we ever know that matter exists if we can't perceive it directly? That's where Russell's going to go. And he brings in an important figure in the history of philosophy to do it, George Berkeley, The philosopher who first brought prominently forward the reasons for regarding the immediate objects of our senses as not existing independently of us, was Bishop George Berkeley. His three dialogues between Hylas and Philonus, in opposition to skeptics and atheists, undertake to prove that there is no such thing as matter at all, and that the world consists of nothing but minds and their ideas. Let me walk you through what Berkeley's argument is and see what you think. If you think that we get knowledge of the world through our senses, do you have any reason to believe there is this fundamental thing called matter that makes everything up despite the fact that you've never perceived it directly? Why couldn't I just say everything is made up of Gugnark? Yeah, Gugnark makes everything up. That's what all these objects are made of, is just Gugnark. No, you can't see it or taste it directly, but it's there. You'd call me a crazy person, right? So why don't you think the same of matter? Yeah? Matter is a word that allows us to identify, you know, whatever it is, whatever physical object we're speaking. Okay. So it's, it's just a general, 
A generalization. Okay. In a way, diagram. It's a way that we well explain what we think makes up the world, right? Let me ask you another question. Can you step outside of your own mind and ascertain reality? Seeing a shaking of a head. No, you see reality through your eyes, right? Through your frame of reference. The information gets filtered through your sense organs, through your unique body, through your unique mind, right? That's how you see the world. What Barclay tries to argue in his philosophy is the only thing that you have access to to understand the world is your ideas. You don't have anything else. This color, it's an idea in your mind. The sensation of hardness, that's an idea in your mind. The smoothness, that's an idea. And so if you think that your ideas actually represent what's out there, aren't you making a logical leap? How could you know that for sure if all you have access to are your perceptions of things? Could you ever know that this stuff is made of some different material than what's in your mind? How could you know that? On this baseless, Barclay is going to say, this belief in matter is a superstition. All you have access to are your ideas and perceptions of things. And this leads into a view that's known as idealism. He says that all that exists are ideas and minds. That's it. You can't prove matter exists. You can't prove that tables and chairs are physical and different from what you are because all you have access to are your ideas and perceptions. He would say that when we talk about a thing existing, what we're saying is, I have a perception. If we were to say this table exists, what we mean to say is, I am imagining it, or I am perceiving it. And so somehow he thinks the existence of a thing and its perception are inseparable. To have a common, common sense view of reality, that there are objects out there existing independently of you, causing you to have certain ideas, is a ridiculous leap in logic. So what do you think? Does he have a good argument? Is anybody convinced? Uh, yeah. Yep. It's all ideas and concepts that we just accept as reality. Yeah. Yeah. I think Barclay would agree. He's not saying that any of this stuff is any less real. He's saying this table's real. Your laptop's real. Your hair is real. It's just not what you thought it was. It's not made of this thing called matter. It's made of the same stuff that your consciousness is made of. And the reason that he's going to say that is because he's going to say, the only thing that you can know for sure with certainty is that consciousness exists. Because that's all that you immediately have access to, is your consciousness. So this belief in matter, superstition, stupid. Matt, you can't prove matter exists. You can't prove that these objects have an, an existence independent of perception. He's famous for bringing up this idea, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to hear it, does it make a sound? 
You know what he says? If there's no mind to perceive it, it does not make a sound. So what do you think? Yeah? I, I, I could see why you would think that, yeah. Your existence of your own consciousness, though, is not an appeal to ignorance, right? No, but the point of, like, oh, well, you don't know that it's not a matter, or, like, you can't prove that, so it's not, or it's not true. Yeah, let, let me give some more context. Maybe that'll help. Barclay's going to say all you have access to are your perceptions. So to believe that there are things out there made of a different substance than your consciousness is, is a leap in logic. You can't show that, you can't prove that. Now, the reason why he's attracted to this idealist view is because he thinks it has less presumptions than the scientific materialistic worldview. He thinks that his philosophy can explain everything that science can with less assumptions. All this stuff is ideas and minds, baby. That's it. Now, we might be able to fault him for that because he does make a leap of logic there, right? The fact that we can't prove or show that matter exists doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? So maybe making that extra step and saying all that there is are minds and ideas is a logical leap. Yeah. So you can see how investigating these questions might lead you to some very strange conclusions, right? Barclay was a logical guy, okay? He's not a superstitious person. And if he could come up with this view and believe in it very strongly and provide a bunch of arguments for it, well, that should give you some incentive to think about these things yourself and sharpen your own critical thinking skills. Yes? So this is one possible view that you could have. Everything is made up of one underlying substance. What is that substance? Consciousness. It's not physical. And so, what does he say? Hylas has hitherto believed in matter, but he, has, he is no match for Philonus, who mercilessly drives him into contradictions and paradoxes and makes his own denial of matter seem in the end as if it were almost common sense. The arguments employed are of very different value. Some are important and sound, others are confused or quibbling. But Barclay retains the merit of having shown that the existence of of matter is capable of being denied without absurdity. And that if there are any things that exist independently of us, they cannot be the immediate objects of our sensations. There are two different questions involved when we ask whether matter exists. And it is important to keep them clear. We commonly mean by matter something which is opposed to different than mind. Something which we think of as occupying space, and as radically incapable of any sort of thought or consciousness. This is how we think of matter, right? Can a chair have an idea? Does a table have a mind? Does a stone feel? No. Okay, so we have that idea of something. It is chiefly in this sense that Barclay denies matter. That is to say, he does not deny that the sense data, which we commonly take as signs of the existence of the table, are really signs of the existence of something independent of us. But he does deny that this something is non-mental. So what he's trying to get at there is that, like, look, Barclay believes tables and chairs and rocks exist, that rivers and mountains exist, that scientific instruments exist. He just doesn't think, it, think it's made up of this thing called matter. He thinks that it's made up of mental stuff. The same kind of stuff that we're made up of. If you believe that the mind is different 
than the body or the brain, for example. He admits that there must be something which continues to exist when we go out of the room or shut our eyes, and that what we call seeing the table does really give us reason for believing in something which persists even when we are not seeing it. But he thinks that this something cannot be radically different in nature from what we see and cannot be independent of seeing altogether, though it must be independent of our individual subjective seeing. He is thus led to regard the real table as an idea in the mind of God. Such an idea has the required permanence and independence of ourselves without being, as matter would otherwise be, something quite unknowable in the sense that we can only infer it and can never be directly and immediately aware of it. So to just flesh out Barclay's philosophy a little bit, he thinks all this stuff is just minds or ideas it's mental stuff. He thinks that perception and existence are inseparable. But why is it that things don't disappear when we leave the room and can't see them? Well, because God exists and God is watching over everything. God is holding everything in existence. Sounds crazy. I know. But he gets there through critical thinking and logical argumentation. Other philosophers since Berkeley have also held that. Although the table does not depend for its existence upon being seen by me, it does depend upon being seen or otherwise apprehended in sensation by some mind. Not necessarily the mind of God, but more often the whole collective mind of the universe. This would be kind of like a new agey view. Right? All that exists is the one consciousness, man. We're all a part of it. Right? This they hold, as Barclay does, chiefly because they think there can be nothing real, or at any rate nothing known to be real, except minds and their thoughts and feelings. We might state the argument by which they support their view in some such way as this. Whatever can be thought of is an idea in the mind of the person thinking of it. Therefore, nothing can be thought of except ideas in minds. Therefore, anything else is inconceivable, and what is inconceivable cannot exist. Okay, so what do you think of that argument? All we have access to are our ideas. It's the only thing that minds have are ideas and perceptions. So, what all this stuff is, is it must be ideas. What do you think? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it ugly? I don't see how a chair is an idea. Well, let me ask you, have you ever seen the chair in itself? Touch the chair behind you. Okay, you're having a sensation, right? Yeah. The sensation is something in your mind, right? Yeah, but then how am I the chair? Like, I don't understand how, how you can like, physically sit on it without, like... Well, this, see, that's where you go wrong. Physically sit. You can sit on a table. You can sit on a chair. Why, why can you do that stuff? Well, you're made of the same thing that it's made of. How am I keeping myself up? Like, well, because the, ch the chair has certain properties, right? So then the chair does exist. It, it, it does exist, yeah. Okay. Barclay's not denying that chairs and tables and bookmarks exist. He's just saying it's not made of what you thought it was made of. It's not made of physical stuff. It's just made of the same thing that you're made of. Mental stuff, whatever that is. Is that crazy? Is this a bad argument? You'll you'll find that that's true of like almost all the philosophers we look at. You're gonna read these people and you're gonna be like, were they high when they wrote this? Probably, yeah. 
especially in the 20th century, all the French existentialists were on drugs. Speed, meth, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems crazy, because like, look, in our everyday life, we don't ask, what the hell is a table made of, ultimately? Is everything just an idea? We just go on about our daily lives. But if you care to really know what's going on and to understand this stuff, you do have to explore and investigate it, right? And if you really have a desire for the truth, don't you have to explore like all the options? Otherwise, you're just taking things on a matter of faith, right? Well, Russell's going to say he doesn't think this argument's that great. You want to hear what he has to say? Such an argument, in my opinion, is fallacious. There we go. It has a fallacy, or maybe multiple fallacies. And, of course, those who advance it do not put it so shortly or so crudely. But whether valid or not, the argument has been very widely advanced in one form or another. And very many philosophers, perhaps a majority, have held that there is nothing real except minds and their ideas. Such philosophers are called idealists, as I mentioned before. When they come to explaining matter, they either say, like Berkeley, that matter is really nothing but a collection of ideas, or they say, like Leibniz, that what appears as matter is really a collection of more or less rudimentary minds. This is also a view that you might see if you do more research into contemporary philosophy. Have you heard of panpsychism? There's a long-standing idea that what this table is made of is made of a different thing than what makes up our minds or our consciousness. Why? Well, look, this table is extended in space. It has volume and mass and velocity, right? Right now its velocity is zero. But what do minds have? Do minds take up space? Do minds have volume? Do minds have velocity? Are minds located at a particular place in reality? A lot of people would say no, or I don't fucking know. And so that has led some people to believe that minds and material things are different in kind. They're made of two different things. Well, a problem arises if you hold that view, that view known as dualism. Two substances make up what exist. What's the problem? Well, it's this. How could material stuff, arrangement of, arrangements of atoms, give rise to consciousness, which is immaterial? And how could they interact if one is immaterial and one's material? Well, some people have tried to get around that idea by saying, this table isn't just made of material stuff, it has mentally bits all in it. Everything has mentally bits in it. Everything is both mental and physical. It's just that this, the mentally bits in the table are not arranged in a way that provide feeling and sensation and perception. But once you get a complex enough arrangement of mentally bits and physically bits, then you have consciousness. This is Galen Strawson's view of panpsychism. Everything has mentally bits in it, including atoms, including lights. Those mentally bits are just not arranged like our mentally bits. These philosophers, though they deny matter as opposed to mind, nevertheless, in another sense, admit matter. What? It will be remembered that we ask two questions. Namely, is there a real table at all? If so, what kind of object can it be? Now, both Berkeley and Leibniz admit that there is a real table. But Berkeley says it is certain ideas in the mind of God. And Leibniz says it is a colony of souls or minds. Thus, both of them answer our first question. Our first question, is there a real table at all? In the affirmative and only diverge from the views of ordinary mortals in their answer to our second question. In fact, almost all philosophers seem to be agreed that there is a real table. 
they almost all agree that however much our sense data, color, shape, smoothness, etc., may depend upon us, yet their occurrence is a sign of something existing independently of us, something differing perhaps completely from our sense data and yet to be regarded as causing those sense data whenever we are in a suitable relation to the real table. Would you all agree with that? Do you think that there are objects outside of your own mind that exist independently of you? What do you think? Does your bed in your dorm room exist? Is that, is that real? Is your laptop real? Is your water bottle real? Okay, so you all think that there are objects out there, right, outside of your own mind that have their own existences, such that if we all died tonight, these tables would still be here, right? If we all wasted away today, Earth would still exist, right, with all its buildings and everything, right? Okay, cool. All right, so we all agree on that. That's good. But obviously this point in which the philosophers are agreed, the view that there is a real table, whatever its nature may be, is vitally important. And it will be worthwhile to consider what reasons there are for accepting this view before we go on to the further question as to the nature of the real table. So we all agree objects exist outside of our own minds. What the philosophers are quibbling about is, well, what are those objects made of? Are they made of the same thing that I'm made of or something different? The contemporary scientific view would say, well, you're both made of matter. But not everybody believes that. Our next chapter, therefore, will be concerned with the reasons for supposing that there is a real table at all. Before we go farther, it will be well to consider for a moment what it is that we have discovered so far. It has appeared that if we take any common object of the sort that is supposed to be known by the senses, what the senses immediately tell us is not the truth about the object as it is apart from us, but only the truth about certain sense data, which, as far as we can see, depend upon the relations between us and the subject. Thus, what we directly see and feel is merely appearance which we believe to be a sign of some reality behind the appearance. But if the reality is not what it appears to be, have we any means of knowing whether there is any reality at all? And if so, have we any means of finding out what it is like? Such questions are bewildering, and it is difficult to know that even the strangest hypotheses may not be true. Thus our familiar table, which has roused but the slightest thoughts in us hitherto, has become a problem full of surprising possibilities. The one thing we know about it is that it is not what it seems. Beyond this modest result so far, we have the most complete liberty of conjecture. Leibniz tells us that it is a community of souls or minds. Barclay tells us it is an idea in the mind of God. Sober science, scarcely less wonderful, tells us it is a vast collection of electric charges or atoms in violent motion. Among these surprising possibilities, doubt suggests that perhaps there is no table at all. Philosophy, if it cannot answer so many questions as we could wish, has at least the power of asking questions, which increase the interest of the world, and show the strangeness and wonder lying just below the surface, even in the commonest things of daily life. So, what do you all think? What thoughts are springing up for you? Feelings, questions? going on in those heads of yours? I'm just going to wait and scoot around until somebody says something. Oh. 
What do you all think? How do you think the world works? What is all this stuff? What's going on? Say that again? <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> philosophy has taught me anything it's that the more you study it it seems the less you know <laughs> okay okay so there's we have some sort of power or ability to make things happen okay cool y'all agree with that yeah yeah what were you gonna say Okay. They can't just imagine that there's going to be, you know, something in here that there's not, and that's going to be a reality. So, like, if you ask somebody to come in here and you like count the number of chairs. Like, how many chairs do you see? What do you see in here? They wouldn't say, "I see dragons riding teapots." Yeah. Unless they're like. I th I think that's probably true, right? It would seem like we see similar things, right? Like, if we can communicate at all, and we do communicate and we share information, it would seem like that provides evidence for the idea that our minds or our sense organs work similarly, if not the exact same. Yeah, would you agree with that? But then the question still remains, right? Like, so we're seeing similar stuff, feeling similar stuff. Can we get to what lies behind the appearances? Can we actually know what things are like in themselves? It's a very difficult question. What were you going to say? I was going to say there's no way to know that other people are reliable. Well, they are just your sensory data, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So expand upon that a little bit. What do you mean by reliable? Like, how do you know that they're thinking independently? Like, you could tell them go in the room and see the chairs. How do you know that you're just not making it up in your brain that they come out of the chart? Oh, right. Right. Anybody could say anything, right? Somebody could walk in here and go like this. And then say, oh, I counted 37 tables or whatever. Yeah. We can't see inside anybody else's mind, can we? We can talk about brain scans and stuff, but let's say I pinch you and you feel pain. I don't feel that pain, right? And I can't feel the pain that you're feeling, right? Maybe I can feel a pain like that if you pinched me, right? So it seems like we've got a few things on the table. We all believe there are objects existing independently of us. Yeah? There are sun, there's the sun, there are trees, laptops, tables, pillows, bed, bath, and beyonds. Okay, so we got that. It also seems like we only we all have our own unique mind that is viewing the world. I don't know what it's like to be you. You don't know what it's like to be me. You can't see the color that I see in my mind that's off limits to you, right? Although maybe when we look at this, we do both see the same color. Okay, so we each have our own mind, our own view of reality, if you will. And then what else have we established? Well, maybe these minds actually do work similarly. Because, like, for example, what color is that laptop? Silver. Silver, I would say gray, but yeah, silver is, yeah. Yeah, right? And we would all see that. 
And if you put your hand on a stove, you wouldn't feel cold, would you? Depends on if it's hot. Good answer. Yeah. If it was on, we would all probably all feel a burning sensation, right? Unless maybe you've worked in kitchens your whole life and you've developed some calluses or something. And is that enough? Are those ideas, beliefs enough to actually clue us into what's really going on? What all this stuff actually is? Yes or no? I think it's enough so that we can survive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's enough that we can survive. Philosophy is not just interested in surviving, though. It's interested in coming to the truth with a capital T if there is such a thing. And so that's what we're going to try to do. Who knows if we'll get there. It's going to be long. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require thinking. But maybe we can come to a better understanding of things by exploring and discussing this stuff. Let me ask you one more question. What did you think about this first chapter? How did it strike you? You have questions, concerns, a feeling you want to get off your chest, an idea? Yeah. I would just say it kind of made me think in a way I haven't ever really thought. Like I really haven't thought in depth about like what the tables are made out of and stuff like that. So it's kind of just like new to me, I said. Cool. And do you like it? Is it interesting? Yeah, I'd say. Okay. Cool, good. That's what philosophy is all about. Is like trying to get to the bottom of things, doing our darndest. <laughs> yeah. I kind of concur with what you're saying. Philosophy, this puts philosophy in a uh, something that was done outside of science and uh, mathematics, but without, you know, but uh, obviously there's some intersection. Yeah. Know, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like some of the questions you add don't, don't warrant immediate answers. And great, we only have an hour, but, you know. Yeah, people spend their whole lives investigating one of these questions, you know. Or they spend their whole lives researching one philosopher and what he or she said. It's crazy. But yeah, you'll see. You have been conditioned into a particular view of how the world is where it came from, and where it's going. All of those views are based on certain assumptions and axioms. What philosophy does is interrogate those things. And that's what we're going to be doing through a bunch of different case studies. We're starting with this book, which is a gentle introduction to, to philosophy and what it's about. And then we're going to move on to some more difficult works that have some complex ideas in them. But the first few are all going to investigate. What is this stuff? What is it made of? How did it get here? Can we know that? These questions are in the realm of what philosophy calls metaphysics, the study of reality, and epistemology, the study of knowledge. And so I would encourage you all to think about this stuff more, talk about it with your friends and family members, because I think if you do, you'll realize you think you know a lot about reality, but you probably haven't earnestly explored all of what you've been told. Okay. Any final questions, comments? <laughs>
Okay, read chapter 2 of this book, The Problems of Philosophy, and we'll talk about it on Thursday. Thank you everybody for coming.